Ready. Wait, sorry. Give me a second. Which one is the present button format? No, you present. Got it. Sorry. Okay. All right. And go. Good. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ruth Del Pino. This is part two in a series of Let's Have a Conversation for Peer Pressure and Parenting. Um, this is something that's gonna be happening every Thursday from 12 to one, so you can just drop in when you feel uh, you can. Um, because this is part two, this is sort of building on the other aspects of the uh, previous presentation. So um, I will briefly explain those in between um, for anyone that may feel lost. So we're gonna start from there. Uh, first thing, where I'm coming from, uh, for those of you that don't know me again, my name is Ruth Pino. I was the Trenton Municipal Alliance Coordinator. Now I'm a prevention educator at the Mercer Council on Drug Abuse and Alcoholism. And I am a prevention educator. I'm certified in LST. I have a TEFL and I have a BA in Global Studies, American Studies and Political Science. Um, this sort of is used to inform a lot of my approaches on the things that I do. This is also something that um, informs how I present information because um, where I'm coming from, it's a lot more of a global politics perspective and a global interdependence perspective as well. Um, I also am 25. Uh, and I know that um, doing a parenting presentation at 25 doesn't necessarily seem um, I, I may be appropriate, but I do have two kids. I have two girls. Um, I adopted both at 19 um, and Jersey is tw uh, nine, Bella is 12 and they are middle school and pre-adolescent. So a lot of what I do is informed through those sorts of opinions. Um, and a lot of what I do is informed through the ability for me to bounce back and reflect off of our interactions uh, that happen. So why this presentation? Um, this is not to scare you. This is to inform you. This is also not a parenting class. I'm not going to teach you how uh, to treat your children necessarily. You are the best parent for your child. You know them best. You've been with them since day one. Um, so you know you would know how to approach it in your best self. Uh, my perspective is also shaped by my learning experiences. So everything that I've learned thus far, I just sort of use as I go along. So um, social media and its influence. So we sort of talked about this last time and how it has does have a bit of an influence on a, a lot of an influence on the way that children interact with peer pressure and the way they interact with each other. Um, so some social medias include Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, we also have normal influence with friends and family and groups of interest. So if you have a child that's involved in soccer, athletics, drawing, acting, art, all those types of things, those groups of interest also inform the way that they interact with their own peer pressures and their sense of wealth inside of them. Um, so I do have a YouTube video, but we're going to skip that for a second. Um, I, there's also online gaming, something that we talked about last time. This is actually where a lot of people are finding uh, a growth in uh, online gaming. Um, nine point, the stock went up 9.3% in the last year. So that means that people are investing in gaming. That means more people are participating in gaming, which makes an inference that we people uh, and children of uh, middle school age groups are starting to be influenced by these sorts of uh, platforms. So um, Discord, it also has a huge surge. Um, Discord is like gaming, but you can do gaming while you're chatting. Uh, so I think that's really interesting and not something that we've had before. It's very live. Um, and I did want to share something about uh, something that I learned when I was in South Korea. Um, in South Korea, they don't actually, in gaming, it, it's such a problem for middle school and high school students that it's illegal for children to play after a certain time. Uh, the government actually monitors these things. It's, they have a chip inside of their Xboxes and any sort of game console they have. And if you post or if you play online after a certain time, they cut your connection off, um, which I find really interesting, but also uh, something that I don't know how well it would go over here, but it is a way for the government to intervene in that sort of policy. Um, also, they do the same thing at uh, gaming, um, the, the gaming, uh, like, uh, what is it called? 
uh, gaming, like when you walk in and it's a, a game, or sorry, arcade, arcade, my apologies. So um, what, they do the same thing with arcades. So essentially what they do is they say, all right, are you, you have to show your ID at the front desk. And if you are doing online gaming, they won't allow you to go on after 9 p.m. And they have that rule up until 11 a.m. the next day. So they make sure that your school is, um, that your school has the, uh, knows where you are, knows what you're doing. And yep. they make sure to report uh, where your school is. And if you go over the law, then they report it to the school as well. Because think about it yesterday. So, um, oh, is someone, oh, Kathy, you need to mute. So I did want to ask now, what are children facing today, right now in this environment? What are things that you think children are facing that really do affect them and the way they interact with peer pressure? We do have some up here, but what, what are some things uh, outside of this that you think would affect the way they interact? So I do have uh, a slide here. And this is kind of informed in a different way. I am from a global politics perspective. So this does uh, sort of center around a lot of different things, but what does it look like for them right now? I think the obvious thing is COVID-19 and the world at large, right? So COVID-19 is a huge part of the way that they're socialized right now. It's a huge part of the way that they internalize information. And because of this, they also use their um, their sort of socialization skills in other facets. So they can't put a lot of energy into one thing, so they put a lot of energy into another thing. So they're reallocating their interactions. Um, and COVID-19 has taken that and sort of shifted the way that happens. Um, there's an ever-growing technology and pressure to keep up. This kind of pressure and technology exists in a lot of places. PS5s, which are coming out, I believe, in December. You have Xboxes. You have all those sorts of technologies that children are inherently interested in that sort of propel them to want to have it, want to be a part of it, want to um, be able to interact with it in some capacity. There's also social and political unrest, um, which also can translate to the world. It's not just in the United States, it's the world. Um, so what we don't understand or what some things that as the United States, we uh, tend to sort of forget is that we have a lot of interactions with a lot of countries abroad. Um, there's no place or no country in the world that doesn't have interdependence in some capacity. Um, we have a lot of multinational corporations and the trade of ideas itself and the trade of uh, weaponry, the trade of you know, economy, all of that sort of is surrounding the way these children interact with each other. And that doesn't mean that they're very aware of a war happening in another country or of an economic sanction happening in another place. But what they are aware of is that the way that these multinational corporations shape how they view their technology or how they insert their technology into other countries does affect the way that they interact with it itself. Um, so I shared last time uh, uh, BTS, which is a K-pop group. Um, a lot of people are interacting with K-pop and inherently are interested in Korea or South Korea because of their interaction with BTS. So um, the sort of broadband of that is that they aren't necessarily a multinational corporation, but they do travel like one. And with those pathways, we can sort of see how the ideas shape themselves. And because the ideas do shape themselves, we also have a polarization of ideas and concerns among many generations and among many citizens of different countries and the United States itself. Another thing is nuclear weaponry. All right. I know that a lot of people are like, why is that on? Why? Um, we're talking about peer pressure. Why is this on here? So nuclear uh, weaponry is, is not something that shapes children. It is something that shapes adults um, and adults shape children. So if you have the anxiety, if you have the pressure, if you don't understand the uh, circumstance, or if you're um, somewhat uh, anxious about what may happen in the future due to arms races and things like that, uh, 
countries shape their policies and fund al allocation funds and allocate funds to different parts of their uh, of the way that they interact with other countries. And if they allocate towards nuclear weaponry or if they allocate towards an arms race, then it does somehow trickle down in the way that children are socialized. Um, now, I don't want to say that these children, Gen Zers, are the generation that faces the most uncertainty. There have been generations before us that have faced a lot, faced wars, faced, uh, you know, many different types of things. But this generation faces uncertainty on different levels, and um, it seems to be more multifaceted than just one or two things, um, such as the things I had just mentioned. So we're going to keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, so what makes, sorry, so uh, we're going to talk about stress and anxiety. Um, I did want to uh, sort of backtrack just for a second on social media. So a lot of our social media and because of the uh, backdrop of all these things that are happening around it, um, it does shape the way that we interact with it. So I did want to go there first. All right. Now, social media. That can cause that anxious feeling. It's the addiction to checking the site. I mean, I can put my phone down whenever, right? But wait, I just want to see who that new girl Erin is dating now, and oh, look at that yummy recipe video, and oh my goodness, another cute dog. It's hard not to get sucked into the social media sinkhole. It's so easy to say to ourselves, one more scroll, while putting off responsibilities like homework, walking your not Instagram famous dog, and doing the dishes. Unfortunately, the more you let yourself scroll, the harder it is to get back out. When you're finally in a situation where you can't check or update social media, like when you forget your phone or you're in an important lesson, you feel anxious. You keep thinking about checking what everyone's up to, and you can't stop reaching for your smart device that may or may not even be there. That's what we mean by social media anxiety. It's almost like an addiction. Compulsively checking for updates can cause unnecessary anxiety in your life, which takes away all the fun of social media. If you aren't sure whether you've experienced social media anxiety or not, here are some ways to know. Do you compulsively check social media every few minutes? Do you feel anxious or nervous if you aren't able to check it? When having a real-life conversation with someone, are you scrolling through social media? If you said yes to any of those, you might be experiencing more anxiety than you need to be. Luckily, there are some ways to get rid of it. Instead of compulsively or habitually reaching for your phone, make it a conscious choice. By saying to yourself, I am going to check my social media, then you are staying in control of the scroll. Keep your phone in your pocket if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone, unless you're showing each other cool vacation photos. This is another way to exert control on your social media scrolling by not splitting your attention as you do it. Remind yourself that there'll just be more to look through if you don't have access to your social media for a while. This turns any anxiety you might feel into excitement and will let you get back to focusing on the task at hand. Social media is a great resource to use to communicate with friends and family. It's always nice to see pictures from someone's trip, and I'm positive everyone would like to see a picture of your adorable pet. I love social media, but I don't like the anxiety that can come with it. We hope that by integrating these tips, your social media... Okay, so um, obviously that's a little different for us than it would be for other people. Um, I did want to share that because it does talk about adults. It doesn't talk about children. So if we feel some of this anxiety around social media and the way that we check it and how we get our information and how the landscape of everything looks, um, the way we act and the way we internalize this information affects the way that we interact with our children. So um, I did want to say that. And also, if we do feel um, that sort of thing happening, um, we are influenced by the landscape and then our children also interact with that social media. So they are influenced by the landscape if they have those kinds of access to information. So it's not just one thing. It's a multifaceted sort of, I don't want to put attack, but a multifaceted diagram and levels of how they interact with their everyday lives. Um, so I did find a really interesting study on Gen Zers and they sort of are our focus because any children that we would have would be 18 and under and that is the generation coming up. 
Um, I wanted to look through it with you guys really quickly, but um, I sort of wanted to preface with saying that this was a very minimal study, but they have done it over the past five years. Um, it was by the Pew Social Trends Institute, uh, the Pew Research Institute in general, and they are a coveted source of information and you can use a lot of their um, graphs and infographs and things like that to uh, integrate into your own presentations and into your own uh, knowledge to know what's going on in your child's life, at least on a social level. So if we click here, um, there are a lot of things that we want to know. We have um, you know, the graphs that are presented. If you go through here, you can read it on your own time. I have the resources at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, but essentially what it, and all these graphs are really wonderful. They're really self-explanatory. But what we sort of realized was that, and what they had sort of come to terms with is that Gen Zers aren't loyal to a lot of things. They're only loyal to their friends and family. They don't respond to advertisements the same way that we would respond to them when we were younger because they're exposed to them so much. They have this level of doubt inside of them that a lot of adults have today. And this level of doubt actually does protect them in a lot of capacities because they don't respond to traditional commercialization. They don't respond to traditional adverts on saying, oh, smoking is cool or alcohol is a really good thing to help you in a social situation. They don't have those sorts of lubrications in society and in social interactions because they aren't influenced in that way. Now, we may talk about uh, Juul and vaping and all of the um, more uh, innovative ways that advertisements are targeting children nowadays. They get a lot sneakier, they get a lot more um, more soft in the way that they approach advertisements. And we will get into that on the next slide. But the differences we are seeing for Gen Zers especially is that yes, they are very individualistic. And that is something that we do need to realize that Gen Zers are all about self-improvement. They wanna see what's good for me. What is something that serves me and in my own right? But the way that they interact socially, the way they vote economically, the way they vote politically, all of those things actually sort of do the flip side of it. So they interact socially, individualistically, but they vote and look at policy and economy in a very uh, sociological way. They look at something and say, if I do this thing, how does it affect other people? If I do this thing, how can how does my how do my parents interact with this? If I do this, how does this happen? So yes, um, they do have uh, differences in the way that they're kind of uh, walking oxymorons, essentially. They're very contradictory in the way that they ha hold their values. They have one set of rules for themselves, but another set of rules for society. But um, the differences we are seeing are basically that they're just children, you know, it's not something that uh, they're that different. Technology hasn't transformed them into, um, you know, advertisement machines or influencers that can't control themselves. They're not like that necessarily in the broad scheme and the broadband of it. They are still children interacting with the world, figuring out what they want to do. So peer pressure is at, at every age um, is hard. Uh, as, I mean, even as adults, we do face that. Um, and I, I did want to sort of reiterate that, that I have a quote here um, from Rudy Fr Francisco, and he is a wonderful poet. And basically he says, I know a few things about, um, about life. Being human is difficult. Being a good human is even harder, but it's still something I would like to accomplish while I'm here. Now, Gen Zers kind of have that attitude when it comes to their policies. And um, that doesn't mean they interact with it in the same way they interact with peer pressure, but at the very least on a soci sociological level, we do see hope that they integrate society into their own opinions when they think about other people. And that's where the silver lining is that when they think about other people, they do act differently. Um, so that's not necessarily different from any peer pressure we face we, uh, we faced thus far. Um, and what makes peer, your peer pressure different than your child's? So uh, I will talk about parent peer pressure during the holidays and how it sort of integrates into that. Um, but for you in general, how does your peer pressure um, integrate uh, into your child's socialization? Um, how and what you say no to matters to them because they see it constantly. Um, how and what you say no to this holiday season will influence the way they interact um, in COVID-19 pandemic era. 
Um, so what it's like during the holidays to begin with. Um, I know that we are gonna be talking about COVID-19 and holidays. So I did wanna sort of preface with that. Um, their stress also lies within the ideas of holidays and holidays are stressful. That's just what it is. So I just wanna make sure, yeah. So um, they also have families they may not get along with um, in terms of a cousin that they don't like coming over or you know an uncle that just makes comments that they don't like. Um, there can be a lot of arguments that are happening during these family dinners or some contention in some fashion. So that adds to the stress um, and the overall atmosphere. Um, and on top of that, uh, knowing that sometimes parents can't afford things for the children and that's just the way it is. Um, Santa gave me this, but I don't have the iPhone I asked for. Or Santa gave me this, but my friend has the latest technology PS5 or PS4, whatever it is. Um, they, we also have stressed out parents. Parents are stressed out during this time. They have to make money. They have to support the households. They have all of these family dinners to, you know, plan. These are things that are happening during every year, every holiday. So this is normal holiday stress. I do have a video um, that talks about a child psychologist and how she sort of uh, says that children should be, um, they should be interacted with, but also that Children are human and they see that their parents tend to be more superhuman. And I think that's where uh, we can sort of, you know, bring back the stress and where there is a silver lining there. That parents act super. They are superhuman in the way that they do things. Their child views them as the best kind of person, the pinnacle of what humans should be because they love you and you're a part of that world. You are the biggest part of that world. So um, what the child psychologist says is that sometimes you just need to tell them that you're sleepy or you're tired or things are a little stressful. So you're gonna go lay down and take a nap. So sort of mitigating those um, interactions is also really important to say, all right, mom's stressed out or dad's stressed out, but that doesn't mean that you're still not a good person to your child. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's something really important to reiterate when you're interacting with your children. Um, so their peer pressure during the holidays now um, is, is definitely gonna be different. Um, actually, I did, I'm going to share a video on uh, parents and how they interact with peer pressure, but especially when people are asking you over for the holidays. So um, when they call and say, come over for Thanksgiving or XYZ winter holiday, you don't want to sound like a bad person if you say no to coming over, but that doesn't necessarily mean you are. So I did want to share some of that video with you all um, because I think it has some important information there. You can feel pressure from your peer group or from family members and friends to get together socially or hang out inside or not wear a mask. And it's easy to fall into that. And when somebody does pressure you, it's really important to remember your commitment to your own guidelines. This is a wonderful time to recalibrate your state and recommit to your own personal guidelines that are right for you and your family. You might have conversations with your immediate family members around how can you maintain social distancing? How can you make sure to wear masks? Um, how can you really not hang out inside in large gatherings with people? I also encourage parents to have conversations with their kids before going back to school because this is going to be really critical as kids re-enter classrooms in the school setting. And I also encourage people to personally as well as in your family write down your own guidelines, even have them visible. It could be on your refrigerator, it could be on your smartphone, it could be up somewhere that you can see to regularly remind yourself. This can really help you get back to that core value so you can have that reminder to maintain it. Okay, so um, basically what the video is saying is that don't give in to what other people say, oh, it's just a meeting, it's just, it's just a gathering, you know, it'll be all of us, we'll be outside kind of thing. And during COVID times, it can be very difficult not to give into that peer pressure because you do want to be around friends and family and, and have that closeness that we all desire. Um, but how you respond to that kind of pressure, how you respond to that kind of science, they will feel it. Children feel it constantly. Um, and the way that you 
the way that a parent acts around that peer pressure and how gracefully they take it does set an example for that child. Um, and I did want to say that, yeah, we do have the added stress of COVID-19, but in general, holidays is just a stressful time. Uh, a study was done by PBS in 2018, and this was their national poll. And basically what it said was that during the holiday season, Americans are stressed. That's just what it is. Americans are very stressed. 58% um, said they're they're fun, but also a lot of people decided uh, and had taken the poll and said that it was also just stressful in general. Um, shopping, uh, family dinners, all that stuff. So yes, this is a stressful time. And oh, and I also have a, uh, a picture over here that was done in 2017. And 64.3% uh, said they were moderately stressed. This was Americans during 2017. And uh, 198 said they were overwhelmingly stressed. But the silver lining is that 159 weren't stressed at all. So, um, but what we do need to focus on is that among that, uh, there are parents, there are influencers, there are people that are in uh, positions of power that are stressed that can influence the way that children interact with their everyday life. So yes, not everyone is stressed during the holidays. Maybe some people find it fun, but it's also just a stressful time in general. Um, I also have here, uh, this is also provided at the end of the slide, um, drug abuse and uh, how you can have holidays highs and lows. Um, I know that this is prevention education, but harm reduction is also part of prevention. And um, it does talk about uh, what you can do if you're feeling the highs and lows of the holiday year. So if someone says, hey, you know, uh, just, just drink with me, it's fine. You know, you've been clean for six months. Why not just have a small drink? And so it sort of walks you through the um, peer pressure of saying yes and saying no and all those anxieties that come with it. So um, I also have uh, another thing that uh, children are heavily influenced by and it is influencers. So last time I uh, sort of talked about influencers and for those of you that don't know, an influencer is essentially someone that is very prevalent on social media that um, sort of acts as a model for behavior and a model of uh, what are the best things to have? What can I wear? What can I look like? These are kind of like idols in their own right. Um, and that's where it becomes a little more dangerous because these people do seem like idols, but they're also so personable because they have such access to their fan base. Um, my niece the other day was on Discord and uh, talking to her favorite gamer. Um, and that was something that I didn't really have growing up. And I don't think a lot of people had growing up. So it was like, you were given such access to these people that they actually become your friends. They actually become part of your friend group. They actually become part of your jargon and the way that you live your life. So um, I am going to click here just to show you the influencer website and Charlie D'Amillo um, makes, has a lot of following, um, 78.9 million followers, um, which I didn't think was possible, but that's, that's a good portion of the United States that does follow her. Um, and she has a lot of views. It said over 300 million, I believe. So um, that was a really uh, interesting number to come across. But I do wanna say that Charlie is so influential that in one of her vlogs that she had, she had a Dunkin' Donuts uh, drink. And everyone since, a lot of people were seeing it as the Dunkin' Donuts challenge and decided to get the drink that Charlie D'Amelio had. And um, I believe Dunkin' Donuts stock went up like 15% after the vlog. And that's the sort of the power that influencers have around these children. And a lot of them are middle school age. Her following is a fan base of essentially mostly teenage girls. And most of them uh, do see her as someone that's an idol because she is close to their age. I believe she's 19 or 20. So that's that's something to look out for. She's not necessarily a bad influencer or a good influencer. There's just sort of a, a, a neutrality there that still needs to be monitored. Um, and because they aren't a part of their friend group and much like you are a free friend, a thing to play with, children also search for other people and places they can get forms of validation from. So if they can, if they don't get validation from one area, children are wonderful in redirecting their energies into other places as well. Oh, uh, we've got things in the chat. Uh, can you tell me what's in the chat, please, Barbara? So 
So um, here we have. Sure, hold on one second. Yeah. It says, um, youth have more FOMO. What is FOMO? <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Um, okay, FOMO so that I, I mentioned that when they were talking about when they had when you showed the cute video on social media and falling into the social media hole, and you said that that was particular that was that was specific to adults, um, and not exactly youth, but youth do kind of fall into that. But I was saying, a lot of times I notice youth have a lot of a lot more FOMO and. FOMO stands for fear of missing out. So if you think about it, like when I was younger, if you didn't get an invitation to the birthday party, that was awful. But now they see the birthday party pictures unfolding in real life. And so they realize that they're missing out on something. Thank you, uh, Melissa. I really do appreciate that. Yes. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. And uh, because influencers give so much access to themselves and their time to their fan base, children have more FOMO than ever before. So if you're not on the live stream, if you're not on the Instagram live, if you're not interacting with them through a TikTok, you miss those things. And it's like the conversation at school the next day is different. So my niece, Bella, actually um, has a lot of guy friends. And um, they're all really into anime right now. And they're all watching, re-watching Death Note, uh, which sort of perturbs me because Death Note uh, was something that you didn't watch. You kept it in secret. You watched it in a closet somewhere in a dark room when I was a child. But now it's much more um, readily available to people. It's accessible. And you're allowed to be nerdy out in the open. So um, she doesn't like Death Note, but she keeps watching it. And I say, Bella, what, like, what's the reason? Like, if you don't like something, just, just don't watch it or don't, don't interact with it. And she says, but everybody's talking about it, but all my guy friends watch it. And I think that was something that was very powerful for me to understand that even if it's small things, such as watching something that you don't like because you want to fit in, um, those things are a choice for children, right? But as they grow older, those small choices turn into bigger choices. And those bigger choices, hopefully they have enough inner wealth to be like, all right, when it comes to the big choice, I decide not to do the wrong thing or I decide not to do the thing that hurts me more. Um, but we'll see. Uh, and I think that um, that conversation did spark something in her where she doesn't really watch Death Note anymore. Um, she just talks about other things with her friends. But I'm really hoping that that conversation can sort of um, bleed over into other parts of her life as well. Um, so I came across a very interesting study. Um, trends we are seeing and some interesting facts about spreading COVID-19 during this time, drinking and uh, use of drugs is still a thing. It's not something that's gone away. It's just something that is done more discreetly and more strategically. So this was, excuse me, a Canadian study, um, but it is still something that I think is relevant because yes, Canada is different than the United States, but it's Canada, you know, um, there, there are still spaces that are socialized the same. Um, a lot of our influencers, uh, a lot of the influencers on TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube sort of get like go back and forth um, and uh, have an international fan base with Canadians and Americans. So that's not necessarily something that was a cause for concern. Um, so what we did find and what I do find interesting is for most substances, the percentage of users decreased, meaning that if you had um, 40 children that used to smoke or drink or do whatever, now you have 30 or 20, depending, right? Um, but the, what they found is that the frequency of both alcohol and cannibal use did increase in those that did use it. Um, and I don't think necessarily that this is something that's a new realization. This is not something that um, is, is a fact that we're learning that really surprises us. But what we are learning is that because it's predictable, it is something that's a little bit more scary and something to look out for. Um, and because of that predictability, we can sort of see that the children that really want to do it will figure out how to do it. That's just what it is. Um, and they sort of looked at the percentages of adolescents. Um, and what kind of made me upset and when I read it was that 
about 50% of the people that were surveyed were people that, that did solitary substance use, meaning they did it on their own. And this was among around 1400 high school students. Um, so obviously the numbers are a little skewed based on whatever, um, but that is something to keep in mind that solitary substance use means that they weren't necessarily giving in to peer pressure. It was that they were looking for a way to feel okay. Um, and that is something to be cause for concern because that is the largest percentage we have here. And that uh, use of drugs and alcohol and things like that definitely is influenced by outside forces. It's definitely something that outside uh, the outside sort of predicts and uh, influences the way that children interact with their worlds. But also it's just a way for them to look and feel nothing or to feel little about what's going on in the world which um, is something we should look out for. So, um, and the, the other thing was that uh, we found also, or they found also that peers were actually using uh, drugs and drinking alcohol um, via technology. So they were FaceTiming, they were Zooming, they were doing whatever interaction they could, chatting on you know Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or things like that. And 31.6% of them did it over technology. So that means technology was a factor in sort of um, giving permission to these actions and giving a gateway for these children to interact that way. And um, shockingly, even about 24% uh, did face-to-face -face during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, that doesn't, they don't necessarily have numbers on um, what the percentage is for face-to-face -face versus infections. But what they do say is that um, they, they, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of cause for concern in terms of the fact that children uh, don't necessarily think the same way as adults, and they will do face to face things that aren't necessary, and that's something that uh, we we should look out for. Um, I will click on the study just in case anybody wants to see what it looks like. Um, this is the study in general. Um, it does talk about social contexts as well, which is why it talks about technology and isolation and things like that. So um, this is it was what it looks like. There are a lot of numbers here. Um, this sort of was something that I uh, skimmed through very briefly um, before I got the specific facts I was looking for. But um, what I also did look at is that people who identified in certain areas of sexual orientation also in general face more substance use issues, but it was exponential compared to what it used to be. And what does that say? Um, and I think that uh, what I want to reiterate is that people who are part of the LGBTQIA community already have substance use issues to begin with. And because they're home all the time and because they may be with people who don't understand them or accept them, their drug use and their need to um, escape will only get worse. And uh, that is something that I think should also be addressed and should be highlighted, at least in some capacity. Um, so what do children do that affects their children? If anybody would like to put it in the chat, they can. Um, we'll just go through the chat as we uh, present this. Um, but ch adults face pressure as well. Um, they face pressure for expensive gifts, um, you know, I know that my niece really wants a laptop this year. She really wants it. She's been begging for over six months. And um, we're, we're wondering whether or not we should give it to her and whether or not we have the ability to give it to her. Um, family gatherings are also a part of that. Children uh, have family gathering stress, but adults do too. Maybe there are people that you don't like that, are, um, that you're interacting with or people that don't respect your boundaries that are trying to come over, et cetera, those things. Um, Oh, we have the chat. Oh, sorry, give me a second. Um, family and faith interactions that children may or may not want to keep in their lives. Good. Um, that is, thank you, Melissa, for that. So you are right. So family and faith interactions are something that, um, you know, are also part of this as well. And sorry, I had overseen that because um, I'm not looking from that lens, but you are right. So there are faith interactions that um, also are part of that as well. Sundays. Um, you know, uh, for Catholics, it's Saturdays. So you have sort of these um, places that are unavoidable for adults, which means they're probably unavoidable for children. And that means it affects the children in the way that 
it may not affect you. So also not being able to say no when someone wants you to drink. So a lot of at family gatherings, alcohol use does go up. And one of the articles I have showed, it goes up about 25% this time of year due to the national, um, compared to the national average. And um, saying no or drinking responsibly is something that your children see. Um, you are an example for your children. What they see, they mimic, uh, regardless of what it is. Um, and also unrest in relationships. So if you're fighting with your significant other, if you're unable to reconcile differences with your mother during uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas, these are the kinds of things um, that children see, and they they start to uh, their synapses their synapses start to make those connections on like what is their social tree going to look like? What is their what is their interaction supposed to look like? So all things that affect children. So um, what can we do? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot we can do, um, but really what we sort of uh, look at and what we realize is sort of what I've been alluding to this whole time. Uh, and I have a quote here that says, when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join their chaos. So um, I believe that Nurtured Heart sort of looks at this approach in the same way, where you place your energy in the things that are positive and the things that are constructive for children. Um, and because this is the year of worry, this is the year of being scared, uh, it can be difficult to sort of foster those feelings in ourselves, much less foster those feelings in other people. Um, but this is still the year of appreciating the people you have and the people who fight with us and for us. So let them know when you're tired. It's good to see parents as a little more than super. Um, I do have a book that is listed here, um, a Very Well Family. Um, yeah, so Very Well Family, Helping ki Young Kids Resist Peer Pressure. Basically, it's an adult talking about how positive words actually affect formations of the brain when children are growing up. So this is talking about pre-adolescent years, um, seven to about 10 years old. This is where this uh, sort of um, mitigates that process the most. And so if you use positive words, if you encourage them, if you tell them, you know, it, it's okay to be stressed out. I'm, I'm, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to wanna see your friends and you can't right now, but we're gonna get through this. So the, the positivity sort of um, helps the way the formation of the brain happens, helps the way the formation of the brain um, uh, it sort of becomes a healthier brain. And so when we talk about positivity, when we talk about inner wealth and inner growth, um, those are the things that we're sort of uh, alluding to. Um, so I will share these slides uh, if you would like. I, we also have the recording coming up, so we can do that as well. Um, this is the end of my presentation. I also have resources listed here if you would like to look at them. Um, anything else, any questions from anyone? questions, concerns. Okay. All right. So we can stop the recording and uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time.